Hello, everybody. TJ here. We're going to get started with another interview session uh, here at URLaw.org. And today we have a very special guest, David Rodriguez. Say hello, David. And you have hey, to say hello, David. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, as you know, occasionally we do interview people that are uh, out there making a big difference in the world, which is what we want all of us to do. We all have a Christian duty to do that sort of thing. And, um, you know, but today it's, it's kind of a confusing world. So a lot of us are wondering, well, what is it we can do to, to change the system to be effective in this rather chaotic situation we find ourselves in today? And um, we appreciate that we can look to examples like David and uh, see the little things that we could go and do. The number one thing you got to do, of course, is get out of the house. Do just the opposite of what they're trying to tell you to do, because usually that's the answer. And, um, and in this case, you're going to find somebody that really does that. Um, um, David helps parents empower the, I'm going to just read a little inter intro you gave me here. David empowers parents uh, to empower their children using homeschooling, apprenticeships, and customized learning strategies, which, by the way, is something that we, uh, we do for our kids as well. Um, he's a principal at Valor Academy, a homeschool coach and publisher of The Underground History of American Education by John Taylor Gatto, and uh, the world-renowned teacher. He's passionate about getting all the thinkers out of the forced schooling system, and he's, uh, he's created the Gatto Project, that's G-A-T-T-O Project. He's born and raised in California. He sold his business at age 26 and now dedicates his life to doing these things. So, David, thank you very much for being here. First of all, it's really, really is an honor and I really do appreciate that you're coming today. Absolutely. I think this is a very important subject and I appreciate you and your leadership, TJ. You're doing really great work as well. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation to benefit your audience here. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I think what we need to do is just simply talk about, you know, what is, what is, um, you know, what is it you're doing these days? What are you doing in terms of uh, what's your project? What's it, what's it about? And then you can talk to us about some current events and things that you're doing. Yeah, so the Ghetto Project, I've been sitting on it for a while because it's kind of an acronym, as you mentioned, get all the thinkers out of four schools. And as you mentioned, John Taylor Ghetto, the school teacher, um, the underground history book, which uh, I helped be published. He was the New York State Teacher of the Year for um, twice, and he taught for 30 years. And so I wanted to kind of uh, be in alignment with his philosophy, but more importantly, because he was such a humble man, he wanted to basically make all schools voluntary attendance. So he said, if you want to change the system in five years, make schools uh, attendance voluntary, and then in 10 years, you wouldn't recognize the entire system. So the full crutch of the whole mandatory government compulsory school system is its attendance policy. So uh, the whole project is to help encourage parents, support them, give them tools, strategies, tips, insights, so they can gain the courage and the competencies to remove their child from the school system. Because it is one of the scariest decisions that you'll ever make, in their head at least. And as you know, as a homeschool father, and other people out there who've been homeschooling for maybe a year, two years, it gets easier. But the most difficult decision right. is to talk with their father, the spouse, or whatever, and say, hey, what are we gonna do? The vaccines, the mask, or you know, the sex ed curriculum, or the no God in the churches, or all, there's so many reasons why I encourage parents to remove their children, but it's the fear that stops them. So this project is about putting some modules together, some support structures, uh, so they can gain that courage and then hopefully go out in their own community locally and help other families. Maybe start a co-op, do some kind of um, barter system or something that benefits them and their children because in the US, it's 50 million children in the school system and in the whole world, 600 million children in a compulsory learning environment it just makes learning unfun, uninspiring. But as you and your audience members know, uh, if you want to be successful, you got to keep learning. And children have a natural love of learning. And so we want to keep that intact rather than put them in schools at age six. Um, so that's what the project is about. Okay. And it's kind of a step for freedom in general. You know, I love freedom. Absolutely. Well, free, for the ultimate freedom is choosing what you want to think and how you think. And, and you don't learn that from a government institution. You learn that from your own experience and your own efforts and working with your family. Uh, families first. Uh, you know, some of our greatest uh, lawyers in, in history were homeschooled. Uh, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't even attend law school. He went through an apprenticeship and then, you know, just became a lawyer. I wish we had more of that going on today. I'll, I'll tell you, in our own experience, um, when we made the decision to go to homeschooling, was we were having difficulty. We didn't. We knew the public school wasn't a choice. We knew what the indoctrination was about. We knew what was going to happen. We knew that they were going to 
call health education really sex education and things like that. And uh, yeah, Planned Parenthood actually giving the classes now in the public schools here. And uh, you know, what are they going to teach? And um, we went through the experience though of having to make that conversion from, we had kids in a, even in a private school that had some problems that we saw developing. They were using the Pearson education books, which if you know who Pearson is, they're the biggest globalist uh, publisher in the world who supplies the school books for all the schools. And the Catholic schools were using the same books. And in there were the stories about, well, Jimmy has two moms and he has two fathers and little things like that they'd insert into the education, this indoctrination. And when we saw that, we immediately took action. We went to a bishop and said, you know, this is in your schools. Do you know this? The good news is he took it to the National Bishops Conference and they banned those books. So that was great to see a result of bringing attention to a problem like that. So, but he, you have to fight this all the time. But ultimately, we ended up going with home education. And we are in a co-op where we have a group of people that got together once a week. The kids get together so they're with kids. There's ways to be creative. That's my point. And then they have a, a classroom sort of everybody shares teaching environment. So it's not all on the parents, but there's sort of a curriculum there. But yet it's still homeschooling. So, it's, it, you know, these things can be done. And most parents are afraid to make that step because they think, well, I don't have time. I need an institutionalized place to stick my kid while I work for a minimum wage just to pay the cost of sending him there. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So homeschooling has so many benefits. And I'll, I totally endorse what you're doing there. Yeah, absolutely. And just so the audience members know, I'm on a mission to help parents understand or redefine what education is and redefine what homeschooling is. Because for so many years, people had conflated the two terms of schooling and education. And school and schooling is what somebody else does to you for their benefit. And in my opinion, an education is what you do to yourself to create a good life. And this is kind of the broad umbrella understanding is that when you're, when you're thinking, I want to give my child a good education, well, in my opinion, you can't. What you can do is fuel their fire for learning, and then they become a self-directed learner, and then they can actually become educated in their own right. And the analogy is that you can give somebody a gym membership, but you can't give them health. If somebody mm -hmm. wants to be healthy, they have to take themselves to the gym or do some push-ups or pull-ups or whatever they do, and they have to get that health, get that fitness for themselves. And so, again, homeschooling, people think it as like school at home, and it's a difference. You know, I don't, I don't call homeschooling school at home, whereas school at home, it's 10 o'clock and it's math and it's 12 o'clock language arts, and they break it up into subjects. I believe life is holistic. And so just like you and I are talking and learning now, we're not on a particular subject. We're talking about life and freedom and, and these kind of topics. Whereas homeschooling, in my opinion, is when a leader creates an atmosphere where personalized learning can occur. And the reason it's personalized learning is because you are unique among all people, among all gods, humans, their earths, their creation, the nature, your fingerprints, your DNA are unique among 7 billion people. Why? Because you should be unique. You should be who you are and create the life that you want. And so if a parent creates an atmosphere, and uh, an atmosphere is, well, what should I, atmosphere should I create? A peaceful, respectful, safe environment where mistakes are welcome and uh, new ideas are welcome. And you know, these types of reframing of what education is, and I'll give you the five steps of uh, homeschooling just yeah. for some of the new people out there thinking about it and uh, considering. So the first one is forced schooling. So this is the default, the state mandatory compulsory school. Get, it, get them out of there as soon as you can. The next phase is de-schooling. And so the rule of thumb is for every month that a child was in a forced school system, you want to give them a month of freedom. So let's say you remove, remove your child from the school system. And let's say they're in the sixth grade. So that means give them six months of freedom so they can decompress all the stress, all the pressure, all the uh, fabricated environments. Just like how you shake up a soda, you open up the cap and all this pressure has to release. Same thing with your child's mind. They're learning in a coercive environment, so we want to give them freedom. This is called de-schooling. So you remove them, you allow them to de-school. And I mentioned school at home. That's the third phase where parents are trying to figure out how to do it. And then the fourth phase is homeschooling itself. You just create a peaceful, respectful environment. And the, the tip there is to find whatever they're interested in, and then you can build a curriculum around that. We can talk about that here in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the ultimate and the apex of the uh, homeschooling experience, in my opinion, is 100% self-directed learning. And that's also known as unschooling. 
So at that point, then they're just learning because they want to learn and they're able to make their own goals, pursue their own goals, and they still might lean on you for resources or guidance or, you know, driving them to the library or wherever they're going to go, their apprenticeship. But ultimately, it's they understand this is their life. They're responsible for their life. They can play a small game or a big game or nothing at all if they want. But at some point, once a, a child, a young young adult realizes this is their life and they're the, they're the ones steering the vehicle of their own life, kind of a new awakening happens. Because mm -hmm. in the compulsory system, it's basically, here's the assignment, do it. There's homework, there's a test on Friday. Do it, if you don't, there's detention, you lose recess, there's all these penalties and, right. and punishments. And it's like, okay, then I'm learning because Mrs. Jones wants me to learn or Mr. Johnson or whatever. But true success is actually learning because you want to do it. You have a goal, you have a vision, you have a dream. And kids can get that at age 10, 12, 14. They don't have the experience. They might have the um, social um, uh, maturity or whatever you might say, but they're eager, they're resilient, and they believe and they have hope. And as you know, many adults in their 20s or 30s have lost that. And in my yeah. opinion, if you lose hope, um, you're, you're pretty much finished. So those are the five stages for parents to think about. And, um, you know, the sooner you can get your kids out, the better. But just realize that the goal is self-directed learning. And you don't have to be the teacher. You know, so naturally you are. You're kind of a model for them. They're watching you and see how you react in situations. But I recommend my clients, when I do homeschool coaching with them, think of yourself as a um, learning partner, as a facilitator, as a guide, as a coach, so rather than you at the front of the, the classroom saying, all right, kids, time for this lesson, you're kind of side by side. And you're like, hey, man, you know, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? And, and figure out what is that spark? What is that fire? Even if it's as ridiculous as you might say is like dinosaurs or worms or, you know, who, the moon or the stars. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is that to find something where their eyes light up and they're like, yeah, I want to go do that. I want to go swimming. I want to go bike riding, whatever. Because those things have physics, um, science, the reading, writing. There's all wrapped up in there. So it's the passion and enthusiasm. That is the driver. And then once they are complete, let's say they're um, tired of riding bikes, let's say as I was, you know, age 14, 15, you can take that enthusiasm and focus and concentration and you can shift it to another subject. So mm -hmm. for you, you're very passionate about law. You help a lot of people with law. Right. So I help people with these types of things and consulting and, and freedom and these types of, of topics because I like it. I enjoy it. And so this is what we're recommending young people. Now we're talking on the Zoom call, the video conferencing virtually for free. So these devices weren't around, you know, just five, 10, 15 oh, the years. Technology ago. makes it so much easier. Oh, no. Oh, I mean, the fact if you yeah. want to go to Khan Academy and pick up a subject and just learn it, just there it is. Boom. Learn coding, learn uh, writing, learn math, learn algebra. Learn. I mean, I have my own kids. We said, OK, let's let's do let's do a Khan Academy lesson just because you're not getting this concept, maybe. And they do a great yeah. job of explaining it to you. And then you go because, you know, you go there, though, with a goal in mind. See, it's different than when learning. You're just being told what the goals are. You might be going there saying, I'm having difficulty with this. Maybe this will help. And then you go look it up. And it's just like how we learn with adult education. I mean, a lot of people don't think it's important to learn anything about the law, but they don't realize that the second they walk out their door, there are legal issues facing them all day long. Mm. They could potentially end up in jail or they could get a ticket or a fine or whatever. You know, today you, you, you wear the mask wrong. You know, the mask is blow your nose. Is that really against the law? You know, most people think it is. And we, we tell them, Hey, you know, that's actually not the law. As a matter of fact, you have rights. Do you even know what your rights are? Not that you want to be defined and, and, and harm other people. There's just a lot of people don't believe that's going to harm people. That's okay. You're entitled to your beliefs. And that's called the First Amendment. So a lot of people just fundamentally are so afraid to step outside the box a little bit and find out what the law actually is or what it, what, what's really going on. And if they're not educated, if they don't learn at home, for example, that you have rights, that you and this is just one of those subjects. People go, well, what if I get a ticket, dad? Oh, well, you need to learn about your rights. You need to learn about how that works. At least you start with it. And so it's sort of a more of a problem solution way of doing education. You, you let them see that there's this problem and see how the answer is, is educate yourself. And that's how we do it as adults all day long. Right. Some of us, some people are just you know, resigned to the fact, just hire a good attorney and that's all you ever do. So I agree with you that it's, it's that creative necessity that creates the subject matter for education. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that uh, like parents ask you, so what about curriculum? Right. So they think yeah. again, they get to buy the books and it's now math. And just, so we have to go back to the definitions. It's really important because it, there's a lot of mind control about schools and how scary it is. But it's actually very um, natural. Learning is natural and it's fun and, and exciting for both it parties. Is. So curriculum, the core um, Latin root means a course or a path. So it's not a something that you memorize and regurgitate. It's a path. So just like you're on a path in your life and your audience, you guys are on your own path. And wherever you go, left, right, up, down, around, and through, that's your choice. You are a free human being on the earth. Whether you believe in God or nature, you have the, the rights to your life and your liberty and your freedom and your property. This body is yours. And that's why I love the concepts of voluntarism, which you know teaches these yeah. things. And so I want young people to learn these things because it was like a spiritual awakening for me to realize that I own this body. You know, I, I thought like my parents own me or the, uh, the, the government or whatever, but then someone explained that to me. And so in the word curriculum is a path. So whatever path that you're on or your child's on, um, you want to help them like accelerate that path. And generally as a parent, you probably want a happy, healthy, independent, productive child, you know, to grow up and live a great right. life. I mean, these are some of the basics that every parent generally would want. And so how do you do that? Do you use coercion or use consent? Do you use mandates or do you get permission and buy-in? And, and these are the really important concepts to start with education because it's amazing to learn new stuff. And you, and like, I hated reading books. I'm curious what your audience members know got from public schools, but um, they were making me read books like this thick called Jurassic Park when I was 16, but the, the movies in the movie theater, it's like, why would I read this book? So I hated reading until I got into business in my early 20s, and then they recommend I read this book. I said, wow, I read this book in three days. It was um, Think and Grow Rich Think by Napoleon Hill. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Mandatory for like, all those holy, people. Yeah, man. It's like, wow, the uh, 13... Uh, steps of achievement. He interviewed 500 successful people over a 20 year period and deduced the principles of achievement. It blew my mind. So I didn't know there was books like that. So this is why schools are really dangerous because they, they remove the love of learning and reading from children. And what I find is that homeschoolers, unschoolers, and there's a wide spectrum of the type, you know, Christian, eclectic, you know, radical unschooling, and whatever it is, it doesn't matter. As long as your child's out of the school system, in my opinion, they're going to be in a lot better situation for success than being having to raise their hand to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or, you know, to talk. You know, the other question I always get is about socialization, right? So if I homeschool my child, right. they're not going Big to get socialized. Yeah. So it's like, well, when was the last time you were in a public school, right? You, you can't talk to your neighbor. They call that cheating. And uh, the only person who gets to talk is the teacher. So you might get 15 minutes. Um, out of seven hours to have a recess or a break. So the school system, in my opinion, is a day prison for children for 12 years. And I know that's strong <laughs> yeah. language, but I don't know how else to say it when the state of California in their education code, they gave themselves the authority to require child be in their school buildings for 12 years from age six to age 18. If you disobey their truancy laws, then they can fine you up to $2,000 or put you in jail for a year. This is the education code as it stands. So this and is they're just about such a to enhance it. system. They're about to, oh. just to give you that example, they're about to enhance that big time. And now it's going to be oh, this fall. Okay, yeah, we're going to go back to class, but you're all going to sit in a little plastic box and you're all going to have to have a mask on and you're going to have to not touch each other. I mean, you talk about the ultimate conditioning of a subs being subservient to control. That's unnatural. Every bit of it. It's ungodly. It's unnatural. It's whatever you want to call it. It's not normal. And uh, right. yet they will condition these kids to be little controlled robots. That's just the, that's the nicest way I can put it. Uh, and you'll say, well, but it's all for the better good. They always come up with a crisis to get you to, to voluntarily consent. You say you want voluntary consent. Well, they create crises to get you to consent. The, our whole legal system is based upon consent. I mean, all of it. You don't think that you're consenting, but you are by your actions and your words and your acknowledgments. You're giving them authority, acknowledging an authority that doesn't even exist. Because if you put your kids into this system where they're going to take it to that level next, I mean, this is Orwell could have never imagined something like this. 
as as imaginative as, as he was in terms of uh, teaching the illogical as being the logical. This is happening, and it, it's it, what you're talking about is natural education, natural knowledge. I mean, to develop your brain, to develop your thoughts. Your thoughts, by the way, are your property too. Even your your words are your property. I mean, people understand we have property rights. And the first thing they always want to remove when they're destroying a system like ours is his property rights. But people don't understand that that's not, this is not the real estate you sit on. It's your very existence, your very being, your very body. And if the, every little right you give away is giving in to a voluntary system of giving it all up. They have these people who want to draw off the energy off of you want to take what you have. It's like in that movie, Jupiter Ascending. They wanted to get that essence out of people's bodies. They wanted that thing that would make them stronger. And our education system is a systematic way to get us there. And by getting people, home, kids home and getting them to think, I mean, my daughter goes to what's called classic education, where it's a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of discussion, as opposed to root memorization and industrialized, we call it industrialized education, you know, training you for industry, training you for an assembly line job. And um, it's such a different way of looking at things when I see her go through that experience. And uh, so what you're talking about, you know, through that natural evolution of thought and teaching that, teaching people to be self and ind independent, you know, the book doesn't teach you how to get in shape. Getting in shape does. You've got to go do the work. And uh, if they can be taught that in school, that's what's really going to make them ready to handle the future that's in store for the masses who are going to be completely lost. I don't want my kids in that environment. I want to be out there thinking and creating and, you know, doing, um, you know, helping other people. and they won't learn that in the public education system at all. That's right. And it's by design, you know, um, yeah, of course. as a speaker, speaker yourself, you know that the most fearful um, act, action is public speaking. You know, most people, I think the surveys say people would rather die than speak in public. Well, if you look at a four-year-old or a five-year-old, they have no problem speaking in public. But after five years, they're age 10 or 12, you know, and they had to raise their hand. The teacher mocked them or the kids laughed at them. Now all that confidence that was yeah. innate enthusiasm, it gets down. And now they're worried about what people think. So this is a curriculum which I created. I have a, a free homeschool group, but it's free for now at least, called Homeschool Leader on Facebook. You guys can join. I have about 20 different curriculums I've designed in there. You can take a look at it. You say Homeschool Leaders a, on Facebook? Yep, Homeschool Leader. Yep. Okay. Yep. Make sure we and get that so across. The curriculum, yeah, one curriculum is called the Presentation Curriculum. And all it is, it's very simple. As I mentioned, the, the definition of curriculum, very simple. And it's a, it's a mindset for you, the parent, the mom, the dad, the grandparents out there. So when your five-year-old or seven-year-old comes up and they're excited because they got a worm or they got a flower, something that you might think that's not important, let them, whether you, even if you're busy doing something, they come up and they want to tell you something. Turn to them, give them two minutes of your attention and say, honey, tell me, what, what do you have there? And they're going to say, I love this and that and great. And just, and just let them burst of that passion and that, that communication right. because what you're doing is giving them two things. One, you're giving them an audience that cares, that's safe. And two, you're allowing them to find the words, to uh, uh, search their brain for the certain words and the expressions. And they say, thank you, honey. I got to get back to work now. But that was really interesting. Thanks for telling me that. And if you get in the habit of allowing your child, when, they, when you see that fire in their eyes, wherever it is, in a car, in your house, or outside, and they say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to tell you this. Great. Tell me what it is, and I'll get back to work. And they'll tell you, give them a two- or three-minute audience. And as they become more confident to give a presentation in two or three minutes, that folds over by the time they're 10 and 12 and 14. And by that age, when they're 13, 14, 15, 16, and they're confident to speak about whatever they're excited about, that is the step to becoming a public speaker. And then a public speaker, that puts you in the top 10, maybe 5% of any profession because so many people were not trained. They don't have the skills because the yeah. schools dumbed them down by design. And so you as a homeschool parent, you're having the foresight to realize, hey, this public school system looks pretty bad. And it is. So this is a kind of a, one of the mindsets, one of the techniques that I um, help my clients with is that just give them an audience, you know, give them that space so that they can just burst and explain these things. And I find that um, that gives the, the child confidence and makes the, the mom and dad feel comfortable. And this is just part of the process as you become a homeschool leader where uh, you can basically be hands off, just be an audience and that support um, person for your child.
Yeah, it's, um, I think we're really, uh, people need to realize that this the issue where a lot of people are now having to stay at home and work, this is an opportunity to take advantage of homeschooling for your kids rather than a burden. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my kids? My kids are home. I'm home. I'm going to keep them home, homeschool them. This is your chance. It's your chance to really build that child into something more than just sending them back to the institution that's going to institutionalize them, the government school. I mean, this is a great opportunity. And I think that uh, people should, I, I think you're going to see this fall, particularly an explosion in homeschool, homeschool curriculum demand. Um, you know, uh, there, there, I know a lot of the public schools even offer a homeschool option, which I don't recommend. It's too, it's still too in a box structured, still the same Pearson organization who's the, the biggest propaganda artist in the world. They're in they're writing the books for your kids. So, yeah, take, be creative, do a little research and homework for your kids to keep them having that creative ability to grow, especially in this environment. You don't want them sitting on the inside of a plastic box, inside of a box, inside of a cage all day long down at the public school. I mean, come on. I mean, they make great prisoners. If they come out and they ever go to prison, they will be the model prisoner. That's really good. You prepared them well. Because yeah. they also have 100,000 statutes to put your kids in prison with now, too, by the way. And uh, it is I don't understand. There's system. over 100,000 of them now. Mm. <laughs> and so you you got to be creative. You've got to be outside the box. You've got to be brave. You've got to speak out, even when it's uncomfortable. You'll never learn that inside the box. Mm -hmm. That's no. right. And one thing, one thing you parents out there will never say is I spent too much time with my child. No. You'll never say that because one day mm -hmm. your son or daughter is going to move out and they might be 18, 20, 25, whatever it is, and you're going to say, no, son, daughter, don't leave. Stay, right? You love your child, but they're going to move out someday. So understand the time that you have, even if they're six years old, you don't, you don't have that much time. If they're six, you got 12 years, or if they're 10, you got eight years. I mean, you don't have much time. I, I'm facing that right now. My oldest son is getting married next week. He's marrying another, another girl. Guess what? She was homeschooled and so he was homeschooled. Nice. They're, nice. They, and they're just so different than other people out there. And they're going off yeah. to school soon. They're already halfway through their school. They both jumped into a program where they did two years of college at home. And so the, by the time they graduated high school, they both had two year college degrees done. Homeschooling allowed us to do that kind of a program. Now you do have to step into the institution there a little bit. But they immediately saw when they went to that institution, like, wow, <laughs> that was kind of, they, they had to make an adjustment. But because of that also, they were totally on their own. They totally handled it themselves. They didn't need extra help. They all got great grades, both of them, because they had that preparation that they were, they were the head of the class instantly. And my second son, who when he was six years old, was told he would never be able to do math because he, he was on the autism spectrum. He was told by the public schools, he needs public special education. He'll never be able to do math. He just finished trigonometry, algebra two, and two years of engineering classes. And he never stepped foot in a classroom in college. <laughs> oh, that's great. Congratulations, man. See what I'm saying? So I know when you're telling me, I'm giving you a firsthand testimonial that this can happen. And never underestimate the powers that God or nature gave you uh, to do more. It's it, it, usually we're only limited by what we're told we're limited by and right. that we're, how, where do we learn that? Where do we learn those limits? And these kids have each of them it just made me so proud. They both became Eagle Scouts, which is kind of a lot of people say, well, that's kind of like a, you know, putting them in the box. But reality is it teaches them a lot of skills. That's what I wanted them to have is those skills, outdoor skills, mm -hmm. learn how to be a leader, be a speaker. They have yeah. to speak a lot. So it was, it was all part of the education in my opinion, but you know, not many people yep. can say they have two kids that are Eagle Scouts. My point is, is that yeah. these kids, because they were homeschooled, have far achieved way beyond what their counterparts in the public schools are doing. And they're barely halfway through college. Mm -hmm. So That's I know crazy. it works. Well, you bring up a good point about the college, because this is another question. It's like, well, if I homeschool my child, can they get into college? Well, <laughs> you just demonstrated that they can do the community college or the, the distance learning and get a degree. But here's what's even more exciting. If your children or their you know, fiance and stuff go, decide to go to university or do whatever, 
when they go out and do great things in life, they're going to say, wow, you know, TJ, your son's really great. You know, like, um, where did he go to college? And they're going to say, oh, XYZ University. Wow, that's a great university. But it's not the university who made him smart. Mm -hmm. It's the parents. It's you guys who've created that space where they could study what they want to do and, and have freedom to learn. And so universities actually look for homeschool students. Yep. Number yeah. one, because they... They want to be there. These guys want to be there because they actually still have the love of learning. And then number two, homeschool people often grow up and do great things in life. You know, um, the Human Genome Project was uh, one of the co-founders was Francis Collins. He was a homeschooler. So it's yeah. like, where did he go to college? He was homeschooled. So they yeah. love these types of students that sit there and actually want to be there. And these colleges love that the um, they complete the the uh, tuition. So they get all the money from the tuition. They don't waste yeah. the seat, right? They don't get no dropout. So it's again, it's a business. The public school system is a $700 billion business. And the university and college is also a large business. Yes, so they, they want that money. And these um, homeschool students fulfill the seats. They become uh, famous or they get a good brand name, a good impression on other people. And they say, wow, that's a good university. But it's actually you, the mom and the dad, helping demonstrate the values, the traditions, the faith, uh, whatever's important, your beliefs inside your home. And they say, oh, dad's a good guy. Mom's a good lady. And they see that. And then they go out in the world and they can contrast and say, oh, this is how they do it. This is how other people do it. But when you're in a building with strangers for 12 years, your teacher, you know, for 10 months and you never see him again. The day you graduate public high school, you don't see 99% of those people again. It's like, what's going on here? And you brought up a point also about the grades. What I tell my uh, clients is that don't worry about the grades. Of course, it's nice to get good grades in college where, you know, it might matter. But in, in, in public school and high school, nobody's ever going to ask you, hey, what was your GPA? And mm -hmm. they're not going to make any decisions based on that. Generally, just like is the adult world, they want to know, are you a nice person? You know, are you a team player? Are you coachable? Um, are you willing to learn? All these different types right, of you're teachable. Um, aspects. Exactly. Yeah, very basic. And uh, that's what homeschooling does oftentimes. But of course, there's some rare examples that they promote on television because the schools get their money based on the average daily attendance. It's called ADA. And this is what the truancy officers are about. So when you actually remove your children from the school system, the district loses money. And this is a problem. So now they can't buy these things. Actually, they're talking about um, salaries and the pension and all these different uh, businesses that are basically parasites on the school system. You mentioned Pearson, oh, yeah. the book publisher, you got the architects, you got the um, uniforms, the food company. Um, I mean, everything else, the supplies, this is like, there's so many different, the, the computers, right? Whether it's Apple or Microsoft. Well, they it's the same the thing that, listen, the, the, the same thing drives the, the prison industry in this country. It's all the businesses that are linked into it that are driving for more and more of it. So they create more loss so that you'll have more ways to fall into the system. And they, the, the ideal person is somebody that went to a public school because they're already indoctrinated how to live within that kind of a controlled environment. And so it's, it's the public schools literally are preparing you for prison. <laughs> I know that's a crazy presumption, but you look at the numbers and the statistics and you'll see that, yeah, it's pretty much just, it's just a prep course. Um, yeah, we have to change a lot of those things. I think by forcing education, by defunding it, so to speak, if we're defunding anything, we should be defunding education. We pay more per student than any country in the world, from what I understand. And uh, we also pay more for people in prison. If we were putting that more towards self-education and, and self-empowerment, um, we'd be doing far better as a country. Um, but, you know, we're, we, we keep volunteering for those little benefits that government gives you a little handout and, you know, and it's like the Romans chapter 13, you know, who do I pay the tax to? And he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. Point being, if you take the benefit, you become the slave. And don't take the benefit. You, you've got everything you need already. Right. Yeah. And also with the fall happening, I don't know about um, where you're at in, in uh, your state, but in California, the governor recently said they're not they're going to do remote learning until january so over the next couple months uh parents are going to be looking for these types of solutions and so i think it's a real opportunity yeah. to basically leave them out of school you know equip you parents out there so that you can have the confidence and say i can do this and as you mentioned there's co-ops that meet one day a week or two days a week you can go to the house 
You can go to the parks if you like, um, beaches, or I don't know what these various states have closed parks and beaches, um, which is this kind of a side issue, which I'll, I'll mention that um, out here in Santa Cruz, we've been doing some peaceful non-compliance on the beach. And yeah, we I wanted to hear about that. The beaches. Yeah, so, about that peaceful um, non-compliance, they, what you did. Yeah, so the government order was that said that the beaches are closed from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. You cannot sunbathe. You can be in the ocean, but you can't be sunbathing on <laughs> the sand. So we just said, this is such a tyrannical thing. So, so we got together about three or four months ago with about 10 or 12 of my buddies. We went to the, the entrance at like 3 p.m. And we said, we now declare the beach open. And we walked on the beach. The cops came and talked to us, but we said, hey, we believe that we are um, free human beings on the earth and we have natural rights to be here. This is not your beach. And we stayed there. And then it doubled each week. There was like 20 people the next week and then like 40 and 50 and 70. And then if you Google Santa Cruz health officer, um, you'll see that she actually said we have to open the beaches because the people refuse to be governed. And so this is a very secret technique that uh, Gene Sharp talks about in his documentary, How to Start a Revolution, is that if you understand the pillars of power in a dictatorship or a totalitarian state, if this is the table, you don't slam the table, you remove the support and then it falls. So we did that with the beaches and now we're trying to figure out what to do with with, uh, the parks. I think we can do something similar with the parks, but I think the real question, and I'm curious what you might think, TJ, is about business license. Because I'll talk with business owners and we did it yesterday and we went in with no masks and he says, you've got to have a mask. And I say, I have a medical exemption. I have a serious medical condition. He says, okay. Um, but, you know, we're just, oh, we're afraid that the county's going to remove our business license. So I said, so are you saying that you're in terror because the county is threatening to remove your business license? He says, yes. I said, that means the county is a terrorist organization. And he agreed. No. He said, yes, it's a terrorist organization. So how can Except we empower? They volunteered them? for it at the beginning. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, how can we empower them or, or, or galvanize them to basically take the business license, which is a piece of paper, and uh, you know the law better than I do, but there's cases already decided. You can't sell a right as a privilege. If you do, you can just ignore it. But again, the fear and the mind control. So how to do that is the next question. And yeah. um, I guess this is the idea more is, in the non-compliance. Well, I like the non-compliance. Here's the problem. Most people figure out the non-compliance thing after they've already complied. <laughs> and then suddenly they're into a contractual relationship. All law is actually a contract arrangement. You, they offer something and you accept it by your actions, you, whether you even realize it or not. This, laws are not tyrannical. They're usually voluntary. We just don't know how to read them. They actually, it's written in there usually. So if you read every law about business licenses or any of that before you enter into it, you probably find out that technically speaking, because see, the, the, a license is, is, asking for permission to do something which is illegal otherwise. So that's basically what a license is. So you got to know that. If this is how, if you don't know basic things about law. So what happened there? Um, so it, it's permission to do what is otherwise illegal. Now is getting married illegal without a license? No, it's not. How do people get married the last two, two million years without licenses? It's possible without it. To go conduct your business affairs, to move about freely without a license, is that illegal? No. So then why do you think you need a license? Because it was offered to you in the form of a benefit. So if you're going to challenge the business license arrangement, first you have to go back and revoke your license before you can say that, because otherwise you're under that contract. Oh wow! So you have to say, well, I want to revoke the license, and I I continue I will continue to operate under my First Amendment right of free speech, to be mm-hmm. you know to, the right to the to promote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, guess what? That can't be regulated legally. And I can tell you what, I've spoken to a judge in this county who happens to be one of the few that I would consider to be a guy that still understands constitution. And I think most, most of them do, but most of them have been corrupted by money and everything else. Uh, and he said, look, you bring somebody before me that's been arrested or fined for not uh, for, for a new knock on their door and you don't report you know, who you've been associating with, but with your cell phone and some app they put on there. If you yeah. get brought in for not wearing a mask, you get brought in for 
anything, as long as you're peaceful, you don't want to cause a, a violent situation. You always want to be very peaceful. This is really key because then they'll, then they'll bust you for resisting arrest and then they got you. So you got to be always the peaceful warrior. Like I said, remove the legs quietly. Don't be pounding on the table. And you say, well, if this is what you must do, but I want you to know I do not consent and then just let them move, move on. And if they do, if you go for a judge like this one, he says, you're going to go free and I'm going to be looking for the guy that arrested you because they're violating your rights every single time. But be careful what you volunteer for or be careful what you ask for because then you'll get it. And it's called contract. You get yourself into these agreements. So these business licenses, which I've never liked, uh, the people, I have a sister that's dealing with this very issue. Well, they're going to pull her business. They, they threatened to pull her business license. I said, well, they want you to um, just get, get rid of the license and tell them you're not going to need one first. Then if they come after you, guess what? They can't take away the license. And they have no constitutional rights to tell you you can't conduct your affairs. Hmm. Now, I know that there are specialties like doctors, things like that, that maybe a license is probably a good idea because there's a certification required there. But generally speaking, to operate a restaurant, Unless you're causing a harm to somebody, who says you can't cook food and give it to them and pay, have them pay for it? Who created the the law that said you had to you had to have a license to do that? And read the if you read the laws carefully, we did a class recently on how to read the laws. You'll find there's something in there where it's voluntary. Hmm. That's just the art of reading the law. It's it's not hard. Literally a sixth grader can do it. You say, I just want you to look for words in there. Look at how they word it and read to the very end. At the very end, they'll have a thing that'll say with exception to, and therefore of something like that. It's always at the very bottom where you never read down that far. You'll find out that they, they know when they write these laws that they have to make them voluntary. Yeah. We'll start there. Well, that's so interesting. Yeah, no, no, it is. It's the law. And these are such, such important topics of licensing and traveling and business. And um, about was it eight or 10 years ago in California, they tried to make a law to require homeschooling parents get a teacher's credential license yes, to yes. homeschool. In Washington, they were starting to talk about that. And we said, uh, no, thank you. And they, they actually acknowledged that. They're like, you're right. We can't make you. But this you have is to just say one reason. Right. You got to say it right. You got to speak up. And now's the time to speak up, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, if you don't speak up, these guys will just take as much as you will let them. And that's what's happening with this mask thing. I saw a guy in Texas yeah. um, get cited for $110 for, not wearing, for having his mask below his nose. And it was on video. And I just saw this a few days ago. It's like, well, I wonder what he could have done. He, he, he said, well, what if I don't sign it? They said, we're going to arrest you. I'm like, that would have been interesting to see on video because I've learned from other guys, maybe yourself, I don't know what you say, but you just say either declined or um, refused all rights refused reserved. Refused for cause or, like or all rights reserved. Yeah, you simply say, I do not consent or refused. That's actually an offer of a contract. You don't have to be forced into any contract. That's right in the Constitution. The right to contract so also means the right not to contract. It's in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say it, those words, but it gives you the right to contract. That means everything's consensual. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. So if he would have wrote on there, I do not consent, and they looked at it and said, you SOB, man, now we got to arrest you. And they arrested him, and they basically go took along him to jail. Peacefully. Would that be kidnapping? Yeah. yeah well, just, just go along peacefully, peacefully right? and say, I do not, like I said, I do not consent. Give them their name or whatever. You'll go for the judge, and he's going to see that I refuse contract. And, and if the judge knows what he's doing, he's going to say, let him go. Yeah, they might go through the arrest. You've got to be willing to you got to be willing to, you know, to take a Face little it. bit of a licking to get to where you want to get. Because it's like it's all through tyranny and intimidation then. So right. if you're not willing to be arrested, but do it politely. Don't don't be violent. Don't get just don't you know, I don't want these police officers to be hurt. I want them to do their job. But I also want them to know what their constitutional duty is. I'm part of a group here locally who says, well, we need to educate the cops. But let them know we support the cops. I said, hand, hey, time out. I want to say I educate constitutionally respecting cops. Mm. That's the cop I want. And the cop would not arrest you for that such a, for a violation of such an order. I was also told by the same judge who says he met with the chief of police and the county sheriff in this county, and they also said they will not enforce such things. He's trying to educate them because they don't know. They're told to yeah. enforce ordinances and these things as if they are law. They're actually not. Most of them aren't even fully implemented by the legislature, believe it or not. But everybody enforces yeah. it like it is. That's right.
Like yeah. uh, if people say, how do you drive without a license? I said, here, hold my license. I hold hand on my license. Says, now I'm going to get in my car and drive. That's how I drive without my license. It's, mm. <laughs> it does, you know, you can do it. Yeah. Will they hassle you if you get pulled over? Yeah. Identify yourself and you can deal with that. But the fact is, as long as you got the license, you are under that regulation, under that rule. You agreed to it. Mm -hmm. Right. So always understand that you look, always go back and say, did I volunteer for something? Yeah. When I signed my kids up and registered them for school, did I give the school an interest in the safety of my kid? Yes, I did. Now they have rights, contractual rights. Mm -hmm. So you have to deregister these things in order to sort of back out mm -hmm. if you want to go that far. But understand that they're not doing anything that you probably didn't volunteer for. Then you can learn how to right. deal with it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's really important that young people know that they own themselves. And, um, you know, in my opinion, they're sovereign beings, you know, whether it's children of God or nature, um, they are the king or queen. And uh, I think they humanity are. wants to evolve beyond statism. And this is why, you know, it's so interesting to have you at Anarchapoco 2020. Um, with people who understand that you no, know, there should be no masters and no rulers, and hopefully we can get there. And I think that's why it's so important that young people learn some of these principles and learn from you know you and me and some of the people out there in the community, because if we don't speak these truths and these messages with them and to their to their parents, they're not going to learn it. So it's a, it's a bigger right. question of how to get there. But um, I think well, it starts it, with you know, education. Keep, that's what you're yep. talking about. That's what we do. Yeah, but as early as possible, have them understand how not to get themselves into these situations, how to be peaceful. We're not trying to teach people to be revolutionary. Black lives matter. Let's go riot in the streets. That's a ridiculous cause. It has nothing to do with black people. It's an organized Marxist terrorist organization, but be peaceful warriors. Go out there and know how the system works, but where are you going to learn that, that until you get out of that public system, they will never teach it to you. You got to go pick up a book and read about it and, you'll realize that there's a lot you can do to be more free, but it takes work. Freedom isn't free. And it does start with that at-home education, to, to thinking independently. Let your kids think that you're crazy because you think these things, <laughs> that's okay. It's down the road that they will have to deal with it and they will, they will resolve it. My son got a ticket a while back and it was a perfect example. I showed him take it all the way through to the very end. And the very end, you say this and boom, the thing, all, almost went away. He got a minimal fine and no points because he was patient. He understood what he was going to do. He understood how the system works. And, and in the end, it worked out in his favor, his first speeding ticket. Yeah, it didn't totally get off, but it's not on his record, which is a big deal because you wouldn't talk about insurance and all that other stuff. So even if you have these contracts, you can still deal with it. You still yeah. didn't waive all your rights completely. You just made it harder. That's all. Does he have a driver's license or did he go the route and get a license? He has it because, you know, I wanted him to get fully certified, know how to do it. Later on, if he wants to revoke it and rescind it, he could do that. All he has to do is write a letter and send it in. Um, but he has to make that decision for himself. That's the other thing is I can't make these decisions for them because they're going to encounter something like that. And if he didn't have it at the time, he could have, you know, the cops are not very well educated. I saw this guy testify. I said, man, I can't believe they put these guys behind the wheel of the car and give them a gun. But, you know, I, I don't want to have a confrontation with them. I want to support them. Last time I got pulled over, I told the cop, I said, would you step on the other side of the car? Because over here, the cars are kind of coming kind of close. I don't want you to get hurt. He's like, huh? And I said, yeah, I just don't, you know, listen. <laughs> I mean, you got to be that like that. You, you know, you're there to, you're supporting them. I do support them. But I support them being constitutional minded as well. And in that event, they handed me back my papers. I have a little note that I wrote on my registration that they, they call in and they came back and said, have a nice day. Uh, uh. Just because I was knowledgeable enough about how to restructure that contract. So when I handed it to them, I was literally recontracting right there on the spot. Little things wow. like that that we teach. So again, this comes from the being, thinking outside the box. I was in the military. I didn't do that. I, we did well. But when it came time for me to leave, I had to leave because I realized I could never do this for 30 years. <laughs> you know, just be in that box. I thought too, too much out of the box. And that's okay. I'm glad I, I'm, I am who I am. You're glad you are who you are. You think outside the box. Well, we have to continue to be those leaders and try to help people do that. Because if we don't, who will? That's right. Yeah. One of the best phrases is that we are the ones we've been waiting for. And after attending 
an Acapulco for six years and uh, an Arca Vegas for two years. And they're actually going to change the name to Voluntary Vegas, I believe, because to get away from the stigma of anarchy, which just means no rulers, right? I rule me, you rule you, your person responsible, I'm person responsible. I think the word is going to be voluntarism going forward. I like that. Because it just makes sense. Yeah. I well, think, I think it just you remember, makes sense. You, you saw my presentation. I said, I want to be clear. I'm not quite in agreement because I'm, I'm big on words. Words matter. So when you say anarchopoco, I was like, I appreciate the, the, the idea of that, but it promotes a different theme when you say voluntarism, because what I'm talking about yeah. is voluntarism. The law is a voluntary system and I can prove it to you. And if yeah. you've got problems, it's because you volunteered for them through ignorance, mm. through you know perseverance, through just being emotional versus logical, all these things. And I like that voluntary thing because uh, the anarcho thing, I was like, I, I don't want anarchy. I don't want downtown Portland. I mean, I'm like down the road here. I can see what's going on. That's anarchy. Yeah. And those people uh, have no plan. Uh, they have no plan. They don't know what they're trying to do. They're just trying to be anarchists, period. You know? And so, yeah, I liked the, the idea of changing that theme a little bit because then people will see it from the perspective of we want a voluntary society. Look, do we want government? Of course we want some government. They have what's called delegated authority. That's limited delegated authority. They're there to, you know, kind of keep the peace. Things get out of hand. We support that, but we also want them to be respectful of God's laws, natural laws, and our constitutional rights. And we also should be careful about how many things we volunteer for and why that gets us into trouble. So voluntarism is right up my alley in terms of how we teach this. So I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's catching on. I think a lot of people are feeling what you're feeling and I'm feeling. Just You just have everything voluntary. I know this is not a radical idea 150, 200 years ago, but now since the state can just increase taxes, right? You and I, we got to work for a living. We have to provide value to the marketplace on a voluntary basis and actually attract customers and clients. But the state just says, oh, how much should we charge you today? It's such, such a diabolical thing. Also, is property taxes. I'm like, the more I learn about property taxes, I'm like, holy cow, man. This is unbelievable. Well, so, tax has um, only been around 100 years. They could go away tomorrow. Right? And it would be like people go, well, that can't, that can't happen. I said, why not? We did without it before. We just right. had a smaller government. <laughs> we didn't need government for everything. And mm -hmm. it could be done again. I think it's actually on the horizon. But Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of changes are coming. New paradigms. Um, the world's transforming. The Internet's been helpful in that and a new consciousness, people awakening. And so I just want to tell parents, you know, wrapping up here that, you know, you're not alone. You know, the, um, the four school system has been around for 150 years, but it's homeschooling has been around for thousands or millions of years. So it's the four schooling environment, which is the new experiment, which has failed and damaged millions of children. Homeschooling is natural. There's lots of parents who feel like you do. And uh, they're a little bit hesitant, they're a little bit afraid. But if you start to learn some of these things or reach out to me or other people out there, join the group. I also have another group called Apprenticeship Creators, kind of for the teenagers or the tweens, you know, uh, parents of those young adults to join. So you can start to learn about these things. So we start to put our, our resources together, our minds together, and you don't have to do it alone. That's where the schools Absolutely. deceive many parents and say, you know, you're gonna screw them up, you're gonna ruin their life. And as I mentioned before, you're not going to regret having all this time with them. And then you have a vested emotional um, buy-in for their success because you love them. You created them in love and you want them to have a happy, healthy life. And many of these teachers, I'm sure, are nice. And there's also many who are not nice and could care less about your daughter's life. You know, they're just they're trying to get a paycheck, trying to get out of, out of work at 305 um, and get on with, you know, all the, the things that they're going to do. So it's proven it's successful. You can do it. You're not alone. There's support groups out there. Take a look at this interview once again. See some of the concepts that we talked about. And then, you know, come back and uh, try again. Make some new friends there on the Internet. Absolutely. Well, David, thank you. Uh, one more time. How can people get a hold of you? If they have questions, website, email or whatever you want to provide. Yep. Yeah, you can email me at info at homeschoolleader.com. And then uh, soon we'll have some of the support resources at gattoproject.com. Those are some places you can reach. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, got a homeschool leader channel there. Um, David James Rodriguez on YouTube and uh, Instagram. And you'll see some of the videos for homeschooling, for the peaceful noncompliance. And um, there's, we, we're, we started a new thing, lastly here, called the Free Hug Experience on Friday. And it really got some good traction. And so I think we're going to do it every week because we
we have to exercise our freedoms. We don't need the permission to go out and hug someone voluntarily. And these governments and politicians are often tyrannical. These orders are not laws. So you do have a right to go out and give free hugs. And I think if there's a real chance, uh, we can put a dent in the matrix and um, in this whole psychological agenda just by giving free hugs. So some of these videos are on there as well. So Excellent. take a look there and uh, look forward to talking with some of you people out there. And uh, TJ, thanks for the great work that you do. Well, thanks, David. It's just been my honor to have you here. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I hope we can do this again. And uh, let's just all work together to, to, to create more freedom. We create for more freedom by realizing we already have a volunteerism system. We just don't know how to, how to communicate that. So hopefully we can help people do that better. Thanks again, David. And I appreciate you being here. You got it. Awesome. See you next time.